I just wanted to say good afternoon. I'm Dr. Crystal Shannon from the School of Nursing, and I am the co-chair of our One Book, One Campus, One Community Initiative. And before we get started, I just thought I'd like to offer a quick overview of what our initiative is so that everybody understands the significance of the conversations that take place around the books that are selected. First of all, the program goals for the One Book Initiative are to create an awareness and an ongoing dialogue about shared diversity issues. And these issues are a shared learning experience that can take place between students, faculty, staff, local community members, and so on. We emphasize reading as a significant component of this well-rounded education and existence, and it provides opportunities for us to explore and elaborate on many of these difficult conversations that take place regarding social issues that take place in our local communities. We also would like to increase the level of awareness amongst our participants about understanding the impact of social inequalities that can happen for a wide variety of local citizens. And our goal is to work personally to support our efforts to promote social change. So our initiative really is designed as a joint effort by all of us to interact and have these active conversations around, around topics related to our book today, as well as books that are chosen in the future. Our current selection is Conflict is Not Abuse, and this book tackles the phenomenon of overstating harm as a means of avoiding responsibility in a variety of situations. And at this time, we would like to invite everyone to participate in an active discussion with the author of Conflict is Not Abuse, and she will actually be introduced by D uh, Dr. Lauren DeLand, the Assistant Professor of Fine Arts. So Dr. DeLand, if you'd like to come to the podium. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shannon. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce Sarah Shulman to our campus today. I'll begin by saying that early in my reading of Conflict is Not Abuse, Overstating Harm, Community Responsibility, and the Duty of Repair, I was struck by a passage in which Sarah Shulman shares an insight given to her by the historian Nan Alamia Boyd. Boyd characterizes Shulman as undisciplined, literally, which she means in a positive sense. And I was drawn to this passage because the concept of transcending the boundaries of academic disciplines, as they're so often compartmentalized, seems so in tune with the goals of the One Book, One Campus program, which aims to unite students and faculty and community members from different backgrounds, academic and otherwise, in an experience of reading a common book. And undisciplined is also such an intriguing term for one as fluent and as accomplished and as uh, productive in as many different forms of scholarship and art and activism as Shulman is. Sarah Shulman's writing practice spans the genres of fiction and nonfiction books as well as plays for the stage and screen. Conflict is Not Abuse earned her a Judy Brand Award for Lesbian Nonfiction through the Publishing Triangle Association and joined a body of nonfiction works that includes The Gentrification of the Mind, Witness to a Lost Imagination, and Ties That Bind, Familial Homophobia and Its Consequences. Her 11th and most recent novel, 11th, right? Maggie Terry will be published later this year. Other notable works in Shulman's gritty and richly evocative body of fiction are The Cosmopolitans, Rat Bohemia, which is my personal favorite, People in Trouble, and After Dolores. For both her fiction and nonfiction works, she has garnered accolades and awards, including an American Library Association Stonewall Book Award in 1989 for After Dolores, two separate nominations for a Lambda Literary Award in 2012 and 2013, and two separate New York Foundation for the Arts Fellowships in Fiction. Broadening our purview of Shulman's research activities uncover still more distinctions. She was awarded a Fulbright Grant for Judaic Studies in 1984 and a Guggenheim Fellowship for Playwriting in 2001. Though Shulman produced 15 plays in the context of the East Village, New York City's East Village, uh, experimental theater scene in the 1980s and 1990s, she earned particular recognition for her 2001 script, Carson McCullers, a theatrical treatment of that great Southern writer of the experience of not belonging. 
She is co-writer with Cheryl Dunya of two films, The Owls in 2009 and Mommy is Coming in 2012. She is also a co-producer with Jim Hubbard of United in Anger, A History of Act Up. And if any students from my Art in the American Culture Wars class are here today, then this is a familiar documentary to you because we have watched this in class before. A feature documentary that vivifies the essential history of the revolutionary activist group AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power. This project is directly informed by Shulman's own experiences with the group, which she joined in 1987. Also, she and Hubbard have since 2001 maintained the ACT UP Oral History Project, collecting over 187 oral interviews with surviving ACT UP members. Her activists work to secure basic human rights and economic justice for people with HIV and AIDS informs her rigorous analysis of HIV criminalization in Conflict is Not Abuse. She is also a veteran of the Committee for Abortion Rights and Against Sterilization Abuse and one of five co-formers in 1992 of the Lesbian Avengers, a direct action organization responsible for originating the Dyke March, today enacted in cities all over the world every June. She is currently on the advisory board of Jewish Voice for Peace and is faculty advisor for Students for Justice in Palestine at the College of Staten Island, where she is a distinguished professor of the humanities. It is a pleasure to host a humanitarian whose work has taken on so many forms and insisted that the creative and direct action pursuits that they encompass are not mutually exclusive. Please join me in welcoming Sarah Shulman. Thank you so much. I'm so moved to be invited uh, here, and I really appreciate the opportunity. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk for about 20 minutes and sort of lay out the basic ideas of my book. I'm going to read some from the book, and I'm going to talk a little bit to sort of explain, and then open it up for your questions, your disagreements, which I welcome, and your comments. But let me just introduce it by saying that the basic idea is like, for example, when our horrible president, Trump, is always telling us what a victim he is, that it's a witch hunt, and it's so sad, right? But at the same time, the real problems of our country are being falsely blamed on immigrants, on Muslims, on people of color. And in this way, we see that people who actually have power position themselves as victims while actually victimizing people who are not the cause of our problems. And it's this system that my book addresses. So I just start out with a little note. This is not a book to be agreed with. It is not an exhibition of evidence. It is not a display of proof. It is instead designed for engaged and dynamic, interactive collective thinking, where some ideas will resonate, others will definitely be rejected, and still others will provoke you to produce new knowledge yourselves. Like authentic conscious relationships, truly progressive communities, responsible citizenship, and like real friendship, and the peacemaking that all these require, it asks you to be interactive. So I start out with something that many things in our time start out with, which is a quote from James Baldwin. Not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. As I began this book during the summer of 2014, the human community witnessed systemic repetition of unjustified cruelty with exhaustion and frustration. We watched white police officers in Ferguson, Missouri and Staten Island, New York, murder two unarmed black men, Michael Brown and Eric Garner. We watched a rich and powerful professional football player, Ray Rice, beat his wife, Janae, unconscious in an elevator. We watched the Israeli government mass murder over 2,000 Palestinian civilians in Gaza. It quickly became apparent that the methods we've developed collectively to date to understand these kinds of actions in order to avoid them are not adequate. Now, as a novelist, in order to create characters that have integrity, I apply the principle that people do things for reasons. Even if they are not aware of those reasons, or even if they cannot accept that their actions are motivated instead of neutral and objective. 
Using this principle to examine those events, I have to ask myself what the white police officers, the wealthy football player, and the militarized nation state think is happening that produces and justifies their brutal actions. As video and witness accounts attest, neither Michael Brown nor Eric Garner did anything that justified the way they were treated by the police. Eric Garner sold loose cigarettes and Michael Brown walked down the street. Both men tried to offer the police alternatives to cruelty. Eric Garner informed the police of the consequences of their actions on him when he told them 11 times while in an illegal chokehold, I can't breathe. Michael Brown raised his hands in a sign of surrender and said, don't shoot. But something occurred within the minds, impulses, and group identities of the white police officers in that they construed the original non-event compounded with these factual and peacemaking communications as some kind of threat or attack. In other words, these policemen looked at nothing, the complete absence of threat, and there they saw threat gross enough to justify murder. Nothing happened, but these people with power saw abuse. We know from security camera footage taken in a casino lobby and elevator that Baltimore Ravens running back Ray Rice and his wife were having a quarrel. As much as we don't like quarrels with our partners and wish they wouldn't happen, disagreement with one's lover is a normal part of human experience. It is impossible to live without it ever taking place. Intimate disagreement is, as they say, life. Yet Ray Rice experienced normal, regular conflict that exists in every relationship, family, and household in the world as so overwhelmingly unbearable and threatening that he hit his wife, knocking her unconscious, and dragged her limp body by the ankles out of the elevator, leaving her lying inert in a hallway. He looked at normal, everyday conflict and responded with extreme cruelty. He looked at the regular, even banal expression of difference and saw threat. The Israeli government has kept the Palestinian Gaza Strip under siege since 2005. This has made daily life unbearable for its inhabitants. In the late spring of 2014, the government of Benjamin Netanyahu escalated pressure on the already suffering Palestinians, and some factions within Gaza responded with rockets that were of such poor quality they had only symbolic impact. The Israeli government re-reacted in turn to this response with over 50 days of aerial bombing and ground invasion, causing mass death and massive destruction of literal, cultural, and psychological infrastructure. The Gazans were reacting to a state of injustice that the Israelis had created. The Gazans were resisting. They were refusing to go along with unbearable and unjustifiable treatment. The Israelis experienced this resistance to ongoing unfair treatment as attack. Brown and Garner did absolutely nothing but be black. Janae Rice expressed normal conflict. Gazans resisted unbearable treatment. In all of these cases, the police, the husband, and the nation overstated harm. They took nothing, normal conflict, and resistance, and misrepresented these reasonable stances of difference as abuse. From the most intimate relationship between two people, to the power of the police, to the crushing reality of occupation, these actors displayed distorted thinking in which justifiable behavior was understood as aggression. In this way, they overreacted at a level that produced tragedy, pain, and division. It is this moment of overreaction that I wish to examine. My thesis is that at many levels of human interaction, there's the opportunity to conflate discomfort with threat, to mistake internal anxiety for exterior danger, and in turn to escalate rather than resolve. I will show how this dynamic, whether between two individuals, between groups of people, between government and civilians, or between nations, is a fundamental opportunity for either tragedy or peace. Conscious awareness of these political and emotional mechanisms 
gives us all a chance to face ourselves, to achieve recognition and understanding in order to avoid escalation towards unnecessary pain. But, of course, it is not only the police, wealthy football players, or colonial occupiers who can feel abused in the absence of actual threat. It is not only the dominant who feel endangered when faced with normal conflict or when their own unjust actions are responded to with resistance. In fact, these distorted reactions occur in both the powerful and the weak, the supremacist and the traumatized, in society and in intimacy. In arenas in which real abuse could conceivably take place, there are those who feel persecuted and threatened even though they are not in danger. And they often lack help from those around them to differentiate between the possible and the actual. Bullies often conceptualize themselves as being under attack when they are the ones originating the pain. Everywhere we look, there is confusion between conflict and abuse. If a person cannot solve a conflict with a friend, how can they possibly contribute to larger efforts for peace? If we refuse to speak to a friend because we project our anxieties onto an email they wrote, how are we going to welcome refugees, immigrants, and the homeless into our communities? The values required for social repair are the same values required for personal repair, and so this discussion must begin in the most micro experience. Confusing being mortal with being threatened can occur in any realm. The fact that something could go wrong does not mean that we are in danger. It means that we are alive. So, <clears throat> on a freezing snowy day in 2014, I was invited to a workshop run by a social worker named Catherine Hodes. A native New Yorker in her 50s, Hodes is an experienced professional with over 20 years of development and leadership in what was once known as the battered women's movement but is now called Intimate Relationship Abuse Advocacy. Now, intimate abuse is a crisis for New York. The New York Times reported that the police receive 284,000 intimate abuse calls a year, which is about 800 a day, and make 46,000 intimate abuse arrests every year. Now, Hodes had boldly started to notice that clients were increasingly confused about what the word abuse actually means, that it was overused. The paradox is, of course, that many women are unable to recognize that they are being abused, and many women cannot get acknowledgement of this reality from others. Yet at the very same time, Hodes also found that some women were applying the term abuse to situations that were really something else. Increasingly, she noticed that women who did not know how to resolve a problem sometimes described that feeling with the word abuse. So this session had been convened, convened to address that trend with service providers. Now, Hodes' focus was to help social workers differentiate between abuse and conflict so that they could be effective and directed in helping clients in ways that would speak to their real experiences. While identifying abuse is essential to saving lives and providing services, differentiating conflict from abuse is also essential to meeting clients' real need to learn how to face and deal with obstacles and to develop truthful assessments of themselves and others. Quote, Differentiating between power struggle and power over, Hodes explained, is the difference between conflict and abuse. So abuse is power over and conflict is power struggle. As we students discussed and grappled with this insight over the course of the day, my understanding consistently deepened. While obviously significant abuse takes place where one person is being controlled by another, or by a group in a manner that the recipient has not contributed to and cannot change, the word abuse has become overused. People may feel angry, frustrated, upset, 
but this does not mean they are being abused. They could instead be in conflict. Therefore, the fact that one person is truly suffering does not inherently mean that the other party is to blame. People may not know how to make things better, how to look at their own participation, how to deal with feeling badly about themselves. They may not know how to understand their own actions and are afraid of the implications of their actions on the meaning of their lives. And this may be devastating, tormenting, and painful, but this is not being abused. It does not get resolved by organizing the punishment of another person. People may be part of negative friendships, families, or communities who attack outsiders instead of being self-critical. They may be receiving encouragement to blame and scapegoat others. They may live within groups, relationships, or families that do not tolerate the admission of mistakes and that reinforce supremacy ideologies about each other in order to maintain illusions of righteousness. This pressure resulting in the action of collectively deflecting blame does not mean that the person being blamed is abusive. In fact, it says nothing at all about that person, except that they are being blamed. Now, it was interesting being in this class with Hodes because one of the things that she told us is that increasingly perpetrators have gotten control of the punishment system that was originally designed to protect victims. She said that perpetrators increasingly are the first ones to call the police, the first to threaten legal action, to send lawyer letters, or to threaten or seek restraining orders as part and parcel of their agenda of blame and control. For example, the National Coalition of Anti-Violence Programs report on LGBTQI intimate partner abuse noted that the police misarrested the survivor as the perpetrator of violence in over half of all queer domestic abuse arrests misidentifying the perpetrator in same-sex relationships as the one who is butch, of color, not a mother, not a citizen, from another culture, or HIV positive. One of Hodes's many valuable suggestions is to lower the bar for what must happen in a person's life for their suffering to be acknowledged. Quote, the current paradigm is encouraging all of us to think we are in abusive relationships, Hodes explained. And if you are not in an abusive relationship, you don't deserve help. Being abused is what makes you eligible, but everyone deserves help when they reach out for it. This is a strikingly humane idea, that the collapse of conflict and abuse is partly the result of a punitive standard in which people are made desperate yet ineligible for compassion. This is a non-cynical reading of a human condition in which people who have suffered in the past or find themselves implicated in situations in which they are afraid to be accountable fear that within their group, acknowledging some responsibility will mean being denied their need to be heard and cared for. So they fall back on the accusation of abuse to guarantee that they will not be questioned in a way that confirms these fears. Especially vulnerable to this are those who experienced profound disapproval and criticism early on as children, who are later locked into self-righteous families or supremacy communities with negative bonds. Ultimately, the blurring of conflict and abuse, Hode says, is epidemic and leads to everyone identifying as a victim, which is paralyzing the search for solutions. I was moved and enlightened by her insight that conflicted people have to prove that they are eligible for compassion. No one can negotiate without being heard. Shunning, therefore, is designed to maintain a unilateral position of unmovable superiority by asserting one's status as abused and the implied consequential right to punish without terms. This concept of having to earn the right to have pain acknowledged is predicated on the need to enforce that one party is entirely righteous and without mistake, while the other is the specter, the residual holder of all evil. 
If instead, conflicted people were expected and encouraged to produce complex understandings of their relationships, then people could be expected to negotiate instead of having to justify their pain through inflated charges. So, you know, at this point in the book, I asked myself, how did we get here? Like, what is the history of this moment? So I'm just going to summarize a little bit for you. So, you know, like I was born in New York City in 1958. And in 1958, in New York City, if a woman was raped, she could not get a conviction without what? Do you know? Anyone know? A witness. She had to have a witness because a woman's own testimony was not considered enough to get a rape conviction in 1958. <clears throat> so in the 60s, when the feminist movement really starts, it's at a time where women did not expect the state to give them justice. And they did not look for solutions with the state. In fact, there were very few women even in the state. You know, there were very few women lawyers or people in government or judges or this kind of thing. So when you see the beginning of the early feminist movement, you see people looking for community-based solutions. What's also interesting is that the feminist movement against violence came of age at a time when there were liberation movements all over the world. You see a lot of independence for African nations and for nations that had formerly been colonized. You see women's liberation. You see gay liberation. There was a, it was a global time when people were having radical ideas about how to have healthier relationships with each other. And so at that time, the feminist movement against violence, their analysis in the 1960s was that male violence against women and children was caused by three things, patriarchy, poverty, and racism. So they saw this as structural. And in fact, they were not focused on punishing men. They were focused on empowering women. So when you look at what their programs were, it was a lot of what we today call restorative justice. So for example, abortion was illegal until 1973. So before then, women would organize illegal abortion networks, or they would teach self-defense classes for women, or there would be like rape crisis hotlines where if a woman was raped, they could call a number, and another woman who had been raped would take the call. All of these solutions were outside of the realm of the government. They were not asking the police or the government to punish anyone because they didn't have, trust the police or the government. So what started to happen was the demand for these services was so enormous. So many people needed these kind of support and intervention that it was more than community-based organizations could take. And in 1970s, there was a, a program run by the government called CETA. And CETA would pay government money, would pay the salaries of people who ran community-based organizations. But in 1980, when Ronald Reagan was elected president, and that is D-Day for a lot of the problems that we're having now, one of the very first things that he did was he eliminated CETA. So all of these groups, which had become dependent on government money, lost their funding. During the 1980s and the Reagan years, the government starts to take over a lot of these jobs. And, it be, and these, the, enforce, and the, the enforcement of these new laws is the responsibility of the government. And so that meant that the programs were dependent on government funding, and you had to be credentialed by the government to work in them, which was a big change for the early grassroots organizations. But what's also, it pr produces a crisis in meaning because the U.S. government is one of the greatest sources of violence in the world. So for the U.S. government to be in charge of ending violence was a real contradiction. And the people who were supposed to be enforcing these laws to end violence were the police. Now we've all been made painfully aware in the last few years that the police are a source of enormous violence in this country, especially racial violence. But what's interesting is that the occupation of police officer is actually the occupation with the highest domestic violence rate of any job in America, including NFL player. So the police were actually the least qualified to solve problems. And we see this all the time. You know, a guy has a fight with his son, he calls the police, the police come, they kill the son. We're constantly seeing stories like this. But what's also interesting is that in the 80s, this popular propaganda started to appear on television Shows like Law and Order Special Victims Unit were founded at that time. And if you study that program, you see that every week they would have an episode where one person was a completely innocent victim and another person was a totally evil perpetrator. And the answer was the police. So this whole idea that 
people are either good or bad and that people can, communities cannot solve their own problems, but that the only people who can solve them are the government. That was a you know heavily propagandized idea, and the way that the government proposed to solve these problems was by incarcerating male offenders who, in most cases, were poor and often men of color. Because when when you see uh, wealthy white male offenders, they could be protected from the system in a different way. So you see that these laws are applied in a completely unfair manner, uh, and that's where we get to today now. And that's you know that's where we are, and that's why we're in this position where we have this very unreal, clean-cut separation that, uh, between people who are clean, clean, and totally innocent, and people who are completely evil, and that the job is for the government to address them. This is very far away from the idea of violence being caused by patriarchy, poverty, and racism. Because the system I just described is dependent on patriarchy, poverty, and racism. It is not about addressing or changing those issues. And that's the trap that we find ourselves in now. Now, in my book, I give two uh, case studies of where I think you know this whole uh, turnaround has really impacted. One is, uh, you know, I'm very interested in Palestinian liberation, and when you look at the rhetoric of the Israeli state, they're constantly using victim language to describe themselves, much like Trump. You know that they're under attack, they're being threatened all this kind of stuff. Well, actually, they have all the power. They're a militarized state. There's a subordinated people, the Palestinians. They're in no position to threaten that state. And so this language, this victim languages and abuse tropes are constantly used by entities that actually have enormous power. But another thing that I look at very much is the way that people with HIV and AIDS are treated. And you know, this, this issue of stigma has persisted. You know, I've been covering HIV AIDS for 30 years. And in the way things are now, the standard of care of medicine that's available for people who are positive if they have access to health care, which is a big if, I mean, it's not the worst thing that can happen to you. I mean, I, it's, it's a drag to have to take that medication if you can get it. But there are other diseases that are far worse than HIV. Yet, people with HIV continue to be completely stigmatized. And what we're seeing now is this rash of laws globally called HIV criminalization laws. And um, they're all over the world. And the case that I look at in my book is in Canada, which has one of the worst HIV criminalization laws in the world. I don't say, do not be fooled by Canada people, because I know they have this great reputation, but when you really look at a few things. Um, so the idea of HIV criminalization is, are these laws, which many US states have, Missouri has a very strong one, for example, that if a person is positive, and they have sex with someone, they are mandated by law to disclose their status, even if they use a condom, even if they're taking the current state of medications, which makes you not be infectious. So if they're on the current medication, they couldn't infect anyone at all biologically, yet the law is demanding that they disclose their status. So since we see it's not related to health, and it's not related to infecting anyone, it's only punishment. And it's about maintaining the stigma of people who, uh, you know, on people who are HIV positive. So as a reporter, I did a, an investigation of the law in Canada for Slate magazine. So the first thing I asked, you know, as a good journalist was, so who are these people who are being charged? Because in Canada, 250 people have been incarcerated under this bill. And remember, most of them have not infected anybody. So I looked at who they were, and 50% of them were black. Now let me just say that there's like no black people in Canada, okay? It's like 2% black. So once you see that statistic, you're like, okay, this is a racist anti-immigrant measure that has ridden on fear and stigma around people with AIDS. And the way it applies to this book is that what they've done is they've taken a group of people, HIV negative people, who for 30 years have been understood as people who are responsible for keeping themselves negative, and the state is saying to them, you're not responsible. You are potentially criminally wronged. You see that as soon as you turn people into this victimizing identity, the state now has a lot more power. Because now people who are negative are a whole new class of people who have the power to incarcerate people who are positive. And every time you create a new class of people that have the power to incarcerate a whole new class of people, you enhance the power of the state, 
Okay, thank you all so much. Thank you. Well, wow. I mean, her presentation was definitely moving. Uh, could we please give her one more round of applause for really just stating on what's going on with our country and her views on it. If you really look at it, things are pretty tough out there. Um, so again, I'm going to welcome any of you guys in the audience. If you guys have a question, please uh, move up to the microphones okay, at this time. All right. I do know while you guys are getting situated to come up to the microphones, um, the committee actually has uh, a question that I would like to ask you. Um, in your book, you're, you critique what you seem to perceive as the simplistic terms of the phrase, believe women. What are your thoughts on the dynamics of the still developing Me Too movement? I think the most important thing about Me Too is that women are finally being heard. That is the, the preeminent force and power of that movement. And women are being heard finally saying something that women have been saying for 50 years. And that is what's happening. There's other sub-issues that I think are very much worth thinking about. One of the things that I'm seeing is this big push to like fire people who've been accused and this sort of thing. And I, I, to me it looks like it's not that every corporation in America finally realized what is ethically correct. I think that they're being motivated by fear of liability. So I would not in interpret that to mean that there's a wake up or that we're suddenly in a moral corporate state. So I think that that's, that's one thing. Um, the other thing I think that we have to understand is that there's, a there's been a racial manipulation in American history in which white women have falsely accused black men of, of sexual assault and that this has been manipulated by white supremacy and we see this very, you know, if you go through American history, you see this all the time. From famous cases like the Scottsboro Boys, which is a very important case in U.S. history, but also that we know that white women sometimes have trouble identifying accurately black males in lineups because of uh, racist inability to differentiate. So that I think that, you know, yes, people have to be taken seriously in their pain, but we also have to understand that there's other factors and other dynamics in our society that we have to take into account. And uh, would you like to state your question? Yes. Hi, how are you? Thank you for being here today. Um, I was able to write down one of your quotes and I was really moved by it. You said, the values required for social repair are the same needed to repair personal repair. Um, like I will offer how I, I in interpret that, but can you please offer like a different explanation because um, how will you say this quote applies to us as individuals and to the U.S. government? Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Well, you know, like we see ourselves as people who want peace and we see ourselves as people who believe in equality. But then when somebody does something who's close to us that upsets us, a lot of times we overreact. And especially with, um, you know, social media, and with email, like you get in an email exchange with a very close friend, and they're saying something that they think is fine, but you're hearing it in some tone that they didn't imagine, and then you're writing each other these really mean things, and then you block each other, you know? And I, I think that what happens with um, a lot of social media is that we forget that the other person is real, and we don't really talk things over with them. 
So, you know, um, there's something that's really different about talking to someone face to face and having a back and forth that's interactive and seeing the affect and hearing their tone of voice. That's really different than looking at a Facebook post. So like, for example, I'm on Facebook. I have 15,000 people follow me on Facebook and I don't block anybody. And yeah, people write things that I don't like, but like, so what? <laughs> you know what, if you wait long enough, it's gonna scroll away. So if we're going to treat our friends and normal conflict, conflict is normal. It's impossible to live without having conflicts with people. But if we're going to blow up at our friends and not speak to them or tell our other friends not to talk to them, then what we're doing is the same construction as when Trump tells us that the cause of our problems are immigrants. That is not the cause of our problems. Our economic problems are caused because the white 1% has globalized our industry out of this country, and people have lost their jobs, and they have gobbled up all the money. That is the cause of our problems. When he tries to tell us that it's immigrants, or it's Muslims, or it's black people, this is a lie. And this is the same system of taking real anxieties and real pain and projecting it onto people around us and blowing things up in a way that only s ends up with separation. So that's why I say making the connection between the personal and the social. You know, I mean, one of the things that we have to deal with the fact that 36% of our country still supports Trump, that is overwhelming. But we have to deal with that. There are people in this country who do not understand what's going on and who are really willing to blame people based on their religion and race, who they are not even interacting with. And you know, so we need to move towards more communication, more asking people, why do you think this is happening? How is this affecting you? When, they do, when, when, when Trump has a, you know, this country is not supposed to be banning people based on their religion. If you read the First Amendment of the Constitution, we're supposed to have freedom of religion. The idea that our president is saying that people should be excluded based on their religion, that is completely illegal. It is totally immoral. We should be hearing from people about how this is affecting them and how they're feeling. So I'm just saying that on every level, whether it's personal conflict or whether it's social conflict, we should be asking people, why do you think this is happening? How are you feeling? You know, and more people need to be heard from, and that's in our personal lives as well. Thank you so much for that. Anybody else have any questions? All right, I see. Oh, OK. <laughs> We're all family here. Don't be shy. <laughs> Hello, my name is Darnell. Um, I actually have a question, not necessarily about the book itself, but more so the process. Like, did you find um, face any opposition when writing or publishing this book? Because in um, the beginning of the book, you mentioned how people are able to disagree with it. So did any publishers did, or be anyone really helping you with that disagree with anything that you said? Thank you. I had a lot of trouble publishing this book. And it was interesting because it was my 18th book. So I've published a lot of books, but this one was hard. Um, part of it, I think, is because when you're talking about things like AIDS or Palestine, people don't see those things as examples of a larger idea. They have so much anxiety about people with AIDS and so much anxiety about Palestine that they only want a whole book just about that. Just like we're afraid to integrate all kinds of people into our lives and into our communities, we're also afraid to integrate certain kinds of ideas with each other all into one book. And that's what I think the anxiety was about. So I ended up publishing it with a very small publisher. And lo and behold, were we surprised when it was so popular that we went into five printings in one year. I mean, I gave 70 talks in 13 months, 70 on this book. I have been called by so many different kinds of people. I've had such an enriching experience. I was speaking at nurses' unions. I was speaking at seminaries. I mean, it's been incredible. 
So people just really responded. A lot of times, the people who decide what kind of book is going to be published or what kind of movie is going to be made, they are behind the regular people. The regular people actually want more complicated thinking. And so if you can, sometimes if you can just get past them, you can get to having real discussions. So yeah, thanks for asking that, Darnell. Hi, my name's Christina. Um, thank you for coming here today. Uh, my question, as you stated, much of our government is functioning on um, patriarchy, poverty, and racism. So can you share with us some actionable changes that you could see us implementing to impact that structure? OK, I think that there's a lot of different, we need different strategies at once. You know, historically, when our movements have succeeded and moved the country forward, it's because we're, we're trying a lot of different strategies at once. So for example, when we had black power movement and civil rights, then the country moved forward. When we have movements that are focused on passing laws and getting people elected, those things are very important. Every single person here has to vote, everybody. But that is not enough. We also have to have dreamers, and we have to have community-based organizations. We have to build our communities, and we have to imagine what kind of better future we want. So anyone who's telling you the only solution is voting, I don't agree with that. But people who are telling you don't vote, do not listen to those people. Because if I don't know if you've been following the elections, but in Alabama, for example, that an extremely evil person was defeated because black women voters organized in Alabama and got rid of him. And you know that we have we have some very uh, greedy, selfish, destructive people in government. We have to get rid of them. One of them is to be the governor of this state. You know, <laughs> seriously. You know, a man who who uh, you know. Anyway, I can't get into that. But it cannot all be about that. You know, we have to build our local communities. We all, I know that Gary has a lot of needs, and a lot of our local communities have needs. So we have to be functioning on both levels. So where are you? There you are. Yeah, so multiple strategies. And I think wherever you feel you need to act, that's where you should act. Like, people can only be where they're at. You cannot make people be in a place differently than where they're at. So we have to facilitate each other doing different things and not be telling people, oh, you shouldn't be doing what you want to do. You should be doing what I want. That doesn't work. We have to let each other you know, be productive and effective in whatever realm we all feel comfortable, but we all have to step up. All right. OK, so uh, I actually have a question. Do the dynamics you outline in your book, including casting blame, shunning, and escalating conflict into abuse, strike you as a product of this particular sociopolitical movement? Or do you see repetitions of patterns that have occurred before in history? Well, I mean, we can never forget that this whole country was built on slavery. you know, And that the entire economic wealth of this country comes from the labor of enslaved people who did not get paid for the work that they did. So whatever wealth we have, that is the root of it. So anything that says, oh, things used to be better in the olden days, that is not true. You know, so let's not, let's not be sentimental about the past. However, we are in a really desperate moment. I mean, nobody knows what's going to happen. And some very foolish people who don't even understand how policy works are in charge, and it's because we were lax. And you know, you can blame Russia and all of that, and that is a factor. But I think we just were very lax in terms of being involved and demanding accountability from our leaders. And we have to take responsibility for that. Anybody else have any more questions? Oh, yes. Um, hi, uh, thank, oh, sorry. Uh, hi, thanks for being here. Uh, I wanted to ask, um, how do you feel uh, 
how Ronald Reagan's administration affects uh, what's going on now because uh, you talked about uh, how things happened uh, during the 80s and how uh, women were treated differently back then. Uh, I just wanted to know, uh, what are your uh, views of how with uh, Reagan taking office back then and how it's affecting what's going on today? Thank you, that's a great question. Thank you so much. So the, the Republican Party changed dramatically when Reagan came into office. The Republican Party had been uh, a, basically people who were very money focused and they were looking for, to enhance wealth for rich people. But they were not so focused on controlling and punishing around social issues. When Reagan got elected, he made an alliance with right-wing fundamentalist evangelical people who were uh, uh, against abortion, were anti-gay. Uh, not everyone who's evangelical is that, of course. But this was the beginning of what we now call the Tea Party. Anyway, those people came into the Republican Party. Reagan made an alliance with them. So when, like, for example, when he was the governor of California, he was pro-choice. But by the time he got to the White House, he was against choice because he had these new allies. And that group took over the whole party. They became the Tea Party, and they now control the Republican Party. So that's why you have a Republican Party that the, their priorities are priorities that there's supposed to be separation of church and state in this country. That's the whole idea. You know, that we're supposed to have that, you can you have the right to your private religious views. And if you don't want to be gay or you don't want to have an abortion, you don't have to. But the imposition of religion on secular society is not supposed to be the way this country is supposed to go. And now we have a party that is being run by that agenda. So it's very much against the Constitution and against the um, intent of what a secular society is. All right, I believe we have another student. Hi, how are you? Thank you for being here. Um, you stated earlier that people feel in conflict, but that's not necessarily abuse. At what point can conflict actually become abuse? Well, the abu by definition of abuse is power over. So if you're being victimized by in a, as an individual or as a group in a way, in something that you have not participated in and cannot change, you are being abused. But let me just say that conflict can be just as painful. It's not about one being worse than the other. The only difference between conflict and abuse is that when you're in conflict, you, can, you have the ability to participate in changing it. So the thing is to look at, if we could help our friends and our family members and our community members think about how they are contributing to escalating the problem and what they can do to help change it, then we have a better problem solving. Sometimes it's out of your hands. Sometimes you're being completely victimized and nothing you do is going to change it. That's abuse. But being in conflict can be very, very painful because sometimes the fact that we made some bad decisions that helped escalate the situation is so hard to accept that that alone brings us pain. And that's where we need support from each other to understand that the idea of perfection, that's a delusion. Nobody has perfection. So right now, like if you help contribute to making a situation bad, and you tell the people around you, sometimes people will then blame you. But they shouldn't be blaming you. They should be helping you. They should be holding you. They should be supporting you so that you have the strength to be self-critical without f fearing that you will lose your community. I want to give an example. Let's look at the shooting in Parkland, Florida, for example. Here you have this young man who obviously was very, very troubled extremely troubled. Both his parents were dead. He may have been on the autism spectrum. He was collecting guns. He was crying out for help over and over again. He was posting online 
pictures of himself with guns. Why do you do that? Because you want someone to stop you. And instead of holding him and helping him and supporting him to deal with his pain, he was expelled. Now, we know that the real problem is the guns. We all understand that. If that kid could not get guns, those other children would not be dead today. I don't want to in any way understate how important it is that we get rid of guns. But excluding people because they're in pain never helps. I mean, I'm 59 years old, and let me just tell you, I, I have never seen an example where punishment actually works. This idea of taking people who are in pain and giving them more pain, to me, is not logical. Can I ask an additional question? So you're saying conflict is, can create pain. So can we also see conflict as more of a mental and emotional abuse? Well, I'm saying that the word abuse is overused, because once we use that word, we give up some responsibility. So unless it really is a situation of power over, I'm calling it conflict, because I think we have more ability to change things that we are part of than we realize. Thank you. I think there's another student. Um, I definitely feel as if you said that there was like a sense of distrust in our government. What do you think could be done to improve this situation? Well, they, I, they've got to get rid of them. <laughs> I mean, they're... Cr <laughs> you know, we have a criminal family running our country. It's, in real life, you call that the mafia, right? If it's any, on any other level. They're stealing, they're just stealing the riches of the nation from their own pockets. We've got to get rid of them. And then we have to do, you know, a lot of hard work to try to get ourselves to some kind of place where we can move forward. We're all responsible for this, and especially you, because you're younger and it's your future. You know, we have to particip participate. Good afternoon. Um, I have a friend. He tells me when I dump on him, my troubles <laughs> are too bi too many or too big. And um, he has advice that he says, um, well, you're not living unless you have problems or conflict. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, not only is conflict unavoidable, but and sometimes it's good because being uncomfortable, in a way, makes you realize where other people are at. And the only time we could be comfortable all the time is if other people's needs are repressed. Because we're all different. We're living in a, in a society with all different kinds of people. And everyone needs or has a right to be heard, which means that we're all going to be uncomfortable one way or the other. So the expectation that feeling anxious, being someone is hurting us, that is the wrong expectation. We, you know, we have to learn how to sit with discomfort and not feel like we have to act out and destroy things. We can feel terrible, but the action is different than the feeling. And just because we feel terrible doesn't mean that we have to do something that's destructive. And that's the separation that we need to make. So the question is, you know, how do you do that? And I actually write about this, but a lot of people have a lot of good ideas about what to do when you're feeling really bad and you feel like you want to act out. And they all recommend two things. Delay. Delay is really important. Whether it's you're writing that mean email and you press send, but if you wait three days, you would never do it that way. Right? Or you're angry at somebody and you go off and you think it over and you talk it over and then you come back with a rational approach. Delay is very helpful. And the second thing is the positive community. Positive community is incredibly important, whether it's your classroom, your church, whether it's an AA meeting, whether it's a p good relationship with your friends. Having a community where people allow each other to make mistakes is essential in every person's life. All right, going along with that, um, what, what do you believe are the best strategies for addressing negative group relationships, like distorting thinking, escalation, and shunning, 
when these things are being practiced specifically by groups made up of seriously marginalized people. Um, how best to handle the situation, especially if you occupy a place of privilege in comparison to these groups, and if their actions are being carried out in the name of social justice? Well, I think a lot of us, you know, we're all also in negative groups. Some of us have families that have a lot of negativity. Some of us are even in cliques, you know, where people are bullies. Some of us are in groups that are racist or that have religious supremacy ideas. You know, it's part of life. Let's just face it, right? We all have that family member who says that, you know, prejudice thing. And we have, we, we have those connections. And we need a way to get perspective on it. And it's not just like saying to them, I hate you, I'm never going to speak to you again. No, I'm not saying that. But we need to be able to take those steps to put ourselves also in a positive space. It doesn't mean to destroy the, the, those other relationships. But, you know, if, if you go and, so, you know, I mean, I recommend a lot of um, people do meditation groups. People go to 12-step meetings like AA and things like that. People go to church. People take classes. Some classes I know are not good, but some classes are great. If you ask around, find out which teachers talk about real things in a real way, because the classroom is a place where you know there's not going to be physical violence. They could, you know, the, the worst thing that's going to happen is you're going to disagree. Like putting yourself in a positive space also is the way to advance your thinking. And that, that can be painful. Like when, you, when you're the first person in your family to go to college, sometimes that's very painful because sometimes you feel like you're leaving other people behind. You know, or sometimes they'll make fun of you or you start to understand things and you start to feel alienated. There's a pain there. It comes with the growth, right? But that's still an incredibly important step forward. So if we understand that being uncomfortable is okay, we could put ourselves in a positive place. That's the best we can do. All right, thank you. I think you had a question. Uh, I wonder if you could talk a bit more about um, traumatized ideology and that how it looks like um, supremacist ideology. And like, I find myself struggling sometimes um, in my communities. Like, it's something that we're working on addressing, um, but I get a little stuck about how to talk with folks. Like, if I um, see a friend maybe who's um, overstating harm and acting from a traumatized place, um, like how to talk about that with being sensitive and not um, flipping into victim blaming. Okay, so one of my ideas is that, you know, sometimes people um, try to, you know, sometimes people are raised in a way with, in a supremacist way. They're raised to be very entitled and they think that no one should ever have a right to question them. No one should ever make them have to look at themselves. You might have someone you know who's in that position. They just can't be questioned. And, you know, they are um, very difficult to deal with. But sometimes people who are traumatized, that is to say, when we've been very badly hurt, Sometimes also that makes us not be able to hear what other people have to say. Because sometimes when we feel bad about ourselves, it's so hard to just keep it together. That to have someone else like constantly asking you to even criticize yourself more, you feel like they're attacking you even though they're not. They're just being themselves. And so in this weird way, people who have too much power and people who don't have enough power sometimes have the same reaction of acting like they're being attacked just because another person is different. And so we need to be aware of that. And I think if you want to help somebody that you care about, deal with the pain of that. To help them see that they're not being attacked, it's just that another person's different. You want to hold them. You want to show them that you care. You don't want to punish them or exclude them. You invite them in. You have a friend who's in pain and they're acting crazy. Go over to the house and watch TV. Invite them over for breakfast. You know what I mean? Like, don't say, I'm not, I can't deal with you. You're in pain. Well, then you're just giving them more pain. What's the point of that? Give them a place, you know, to, to, to rest. That, that's what I think. Bring people in more. You know, I don't believe in, in cutting people off. I know sometimes we need to have a little space from people, and that I really understand. 
but the goal should be to have some kind of repair. You may never get back to where you were before, or you may never even really trust that person, but at least when you see them, hi, how are you? You know, it's a human being, right? You know this person. You're in a community with them. Like, just say, hi, how are you? Big deal. You know, you don't, you don't give up anything. Just connect. Thank you so much. I believe you had a question? Hi. Thank you for coming. Um, I have a question about, um, so when people of power, like um, a politician, um, have this agreement between two countries, maybe, and um, it leads to something like war or destruction, and we know people will have to, they will have to convince the people of the country that this is war or this is a destruction or something. So how would you, would you, people, some people, okay, this question is weird, so. <laughs> so like, when people of power have a conflict, um, people of less power tend to be the victim or, so would you say those people of less power are being abused, or what would you call them? Well, I don't believe in war, and I don't think it's justified. So when you look at war, it's usually like the last few wars that this country has participated in, a very small group of people made a lot of money from those wars because they had all the weapons manufacturing. You know, and how do we get people in the army in the U.S.? Well, it's economic. They can't get other jobs, so they go into the military. Or they want to get educated, so they go into the military. Like, nobody should be forced into the military because they can't get a job or because they need money. That's a terrible situation. So, you know, also, these divisions between countries are also arbitrary. I mean, anyone here who is from another country, or your parents are from another country, you know that. So um, this idea of like you have to kill somebody because they're from another country, it's, an absur it's absurd. So I, I, I do agree with what you said, that it's a manipulation. And it's about the power of a small group. All right. Teachers usually don't believe in killing. It's something about teachers believe in t learning. <laughs> Hi, Sarah. Um, I know um, from reading your book, you go into a lot of detail with trigger warnings. And I know um, with me um, and the rest of the faculty are interested on what you have to say specifically with trigger warnings. And um, a half hour away from here at the University of Chicago, that they did away with trigger warnings and they have an open campus where they have different views, people from different views, left or right or whatever, come in to speak on campus. I was wondering if you can go into that and talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, I, I am a f in favor of open exchange of ideas. And I th there are some people out there with ideas that I really uh, abhor. And some of them, I would not want to hear what they have to say, so I just wouldn't go to their event. But the problem with shutting people down is then you get shut down. So if your policy is that you're going to shut this person down and you're not going to be able to talk, then tomorrow you're not going to be able to talk. And then we're going to get nowhere. So I'm like, just let people talk. I know on some hand, some, in some way, we have to believe that most people have common sense. We have to believe that. And if they're listening to an idea that is really insane, like white supremacy or like anti-Semitism or something like this, then, you know, those of us who understand that all human beings are, you know, deserve the same treatment, our job is to say why we think that. And then people will make their decisions. But this idea of um, controlling speech, I mean, this makes me very old-fashioned in a way, perhaps. But because I hold ideas that are not mainstream ideas, I know how important it is that we all get to express ourselves. The classroom must be a place where people can express what's on their minds. That's how we learn. You don't just learn by hearing ideas that you agree with. You learn by hearing ideas that you don't agree with and having a discussion that brings out what you don't agree with about it. You have to go all the way with these ideas. And uh, one of the, you know, so um, I, I hate to say it, but I do agree with the University of Chicago on this one um, point. Nico, where are you? Oh, yeah, thank you for raising that. Thank you so much. Uh, does anybody have another question? I believe you do. 
Hi. Okay. Um. Recently, there was a shooting in Michigan at a university. Okay. Um. And plus, also in Florida, there was a mass shooting in high school. So I want to know if the person was um, Caucasian. Why were police officers not trigger happy enough? to take him down, but yet if he's black, why would they trick happy to take him down? Well, I think I agree with your analysis there. I mean, the rhetoric of the country, like if it's a white person, they don't say anything. If the person is Arab or Muslim, they say that they're a terrorist, even if they're both doing the same thing. A black person just has to drive in their car. They can get killed. They don't even have to be involved in, in doing a crime. What you're, what you're pointing out, what's your name, sir? Chris, what Chris is pointing out is that our justice system is completely corrupt and does not work. Now, my view is that the wrong kinds of people are the police. You know, right now, police is a job that is not well paid. You don't have to have a higher degree. And the kind of person is attracted to it, often who have a certain kind of bullying impulse. Not everybody, but too many. And I think we should reconceptualize the idea of who becomes a policeman. I think the people who are the police should be the people who are the most qualified for helping people negotiate and solve problems. And they don't need weapons. And you know, so there's a lot in our society that needs to be restructured. But you're absolutely right that there's so much racial bias that there is no justice in those cases. Thank you so much for bringing that up. Anybody else have another question? Good afternoon, and thank you again for coming. I'm asking on behalf of a student that had to leave and go to work. <laughs> Um, the question that the student left was, do you believe that today's society is a little bit more sensitive to some of the societal needs than previous societies, previous times, previous generations? No, I think we've gone backwards. You know, the, what we, the most important thing that we need in this country is a functional public education system. And we're seeing public schools being cut and slashed over and over again. I mean, the, the people who are going to private education are paying $60,000 a year to go to college. I mean, this is absurd. And, you know, when, so uh, I would say that our priorities are very poor right now. And we need to return to a time of much more eff effective public funding of public needs. We need jobs creation and job training. We need health care for every single person in this country. We need a better system of justice, not just mass incarceration, which obviously is a complete failure and is a racist system. All of our public sphere arenas need to be reimagined. And so I would say we're in a very bad period right now. So then would you say, quote unquote, what our president says, is that what made America great? First of all, what does great mean? That's my first question. I mean, America has been rich for a long time. But we have had profound inequalities from the beginning, from the founding. I'm sure you know that the first people who could vote in this country were white male landowners. That's how this country was created. So, you know, I think that that whole thing, it's just, it's just nationalism. You know, all human beings, by virtue of being born, deserve the same access and opportunities. And that is across the board. And that should be the, the principle by which we organize our, our, li our time together and our lives together. Anyway, I want to thank you so much for your really interesting questions. You're obviously very intelligent and focused people. I'm very excited that you're going to be the next generation to run this country, and I can't wait until you do. So thank you all so much for having me. All right. Um, so one more big round of applause for our author, Sarah Schulman. Uh, now I'd actually like to introduce our chancellor,
uh, Chancellor Lowe, who will actually be able to tell us what our next one book will be. Thank you, Gabriela, and a wonderful moderator, as always, isn't she? <laughs> President of her Student Government Association. And let me just add my belated uh, welcome, uh, but also thanks for everybody who's here. Certainly thank you to our author, uh, uh, Professor Schulman, and once again to, uh, to Gabriela for doing such a great job of, uh, of moderating our questions. And of course, uh, being able to be part of a program uh, for our one book uh, uh, project is uh, is just always very exciting to me because I love to read. So the idea that I'm promoting reading, you know, always uh, gets me pretty excited. And uh, and I know that uh, those who are here and everybody who joins in one book are people who like to read as well. One of the things that brings us together. And uh, since 2006, the one book, one campus, one community. Uh, initiative has focused on building an intellectual and social rapport among students, staff, faculty, and members of our community, uh, particularly focusing on uh, issues of substance, uh, social issues. And of course, the other thing that brings us together is compelling reading. Now the book by our campus for uh, next academic year, I love that. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Uh, you know, is Women in Power, a manifesto by, by Mary Beard. And uh, Mary Beard is a distinguished uh, Cambridge uh, historian, ancient historian of, uh, of Rome. And she addresses those who mercilessly attack and demean women the world over, including uh, very often Mary Beard herself. Uh, in Women in Power, she traces the origins of misogyny to its ancient roots, examining the pitfalls of gender and the ways that history has mistreated strong women since the beginning of time. As far back as Homer's Odyssey, Beard shows women have been prohibited from leadership roles in civil civic life, public speech being defined as inherently male. From Medusa to Phil Philomela, uh, whose tongue was cut out, uh, from Hillary Clinton to Elizabeth Warren, who very memorably was told to sit down. Uh, Beard draws illuminating parallels between our cultural assumptions about women's relationship to power and how powerful women provide a necessary example for all women who must resist being vacuumed into a male template. With personal reflections on our own online experiences with sexism, Beard asks, if women aren't perceived to be within the power structure, isn't it power itself that we need to redefine? And how many more centuries should we be expected to wait. So this ought to be an interesting read uh, for next year and uh, uh, lots lots to talk about among ourselves. And uh, uh, Dr. Shannon indicates we've already made contact with Professor Beard, so we may be seeing her here. We, that's what we will hope. Uh, now, Crystal mentioned your programs. And uh, if you have a red star on your, can on your program, and I already looked at mine, and I didn't get one. Uh, but if you have a red star on your program, you're going to receive a free copy of Mary Bear Beard's uh, Women in Power. So, and you can uh, collect your book out at the, uh, the registration uh, table. And uh, let me just uh, finish up by issuing some thank yous. Uh, there are some uh, folks and programs uh, that uh, supported the program. And first of all, I want to mention the Addison Locke Roche Memorial Fund. That's an Indiana University fund uh, that's making grants in association with Indiana University's 200th anniversary, which is coming up in 2020. You're very much part of our bicentennial observation uh, re recognition here. Uh, but some other offices, the Office of the Chancellor kicked in, Academic Affairs, Faculty Organization, Student Affairs and Services, Office of Diversity, uh, Office of Marketing, the University Information and Technology Services, and Library Services all contributed. But also, uh, very significantly, we have a one-book committee, and it's co-chaired this year by Crystal Shannon and Joseph uh, Ferrandino, but other members are Andrea Griffin, 
uh, Janice Gerskovich, Charlie Hobson, Latrice Booker, Lauren, uh, Lauren DeLand, Kathy Malone, Aaron Pigars, uh, Tara Jackson, Erica Rose, Terry Ann Defenser, and Nico Casas. I would just ask you to join me in thanking them. So let me just thank you all once again for coming, and I think I turn you back over to the capable hands of Crystal. Thanks again. Thank you again, everyone, for coming to our event today. We have a small reception and a book signing out in the lobby for anyone that would like to get their book signed or that would like to get their program signed or just meet the author. So please feel free to join us out in the lobby. Thank you again for attending.